In college, I'm trying to figure out what I wanted to do and taking lots of different classes. And I seemed to have an aptitude for computer programming. And I thought, okay, that's good. I'll major in computer programming. I'll be able to get a job. But I also really enjoyed writing. I, I had a writing teacher named Betty Townsend who really turned me on to creative writing and, and got me into that. And I thought, I love this. This is what I could really do later in life, maybe, after I've you know, made some money at programming and also kind of developed my craft. Because the first thing is to understand anything in any creative field, games, games are like any other thing you might make. Writing a book, writing a song, making a movie, creating a piece of art. It's a creative endeavor that you create something in, and your first one is always terrible. You need to, whether it's the first story you write or, or whatever it is, your first game is always your first creation is important. It's the best thing you've ever made up to that point. And so you, you think it's fantastic, and at some level it is. But you make more, and you make more, and then after you hit your stride, and, and you become, uh, you know, very productive at what you're doing. And uh, that's the mode I'm in now, I'd like to think. <laughs> but when I started, I never even imagined I would become a game inventor. I, I just liked games, and I, I, I would say, actually, one of some of my earliest game design efforts were computer programming things, because I was learning to become a programmer, even before I realized that's what I wanted to do in college. My first, some of my first true game creations were programs. Um, text adventure games. Everybody played full experience of text adventure games? When they first came out, I was really into them. I said, I, can, I want to make my own. And they were terrible! They were so bad. But I was in high school and I was making games for the first time. They, I didn't even think of it as making games. I thought of it as a program. Um, so, I got through college with a degree in computer programming and not even a, uh, a computer science, bachelor of science, and not even really minored in English. I just took a lot of English classes. Maryland didn't really have a, a, an official minor program. But I, I, I wanted a job, and I got one right out of college. I went to work for NASA. I am a second generation NASA engineer. My dad was one of the first 150 scientists to work at the Goddard Space Flight Center in 1958. They came over from NRL, the research laboratory, to found the new center, and they all worked out of trailers while they built the buildings. And he just, like last year, retired. He was a real fixture there. So I, I originally followed in my father's footsteps, and I went to program computers for the space agency. I wrote code that flew in space on the Hubble Space Telescope between the first and third servicing missions. And that's just also where I met Kristen. And my first summer at NASA, I was writing a short story. And, because remember, that was going to be my real thing, right? I was just programming kind of to pay the bills, and in my spare time, I would, I would write stories. Sometimes I'd even do them before. Uh, <laughs> I'll tell you about that. No one's recording this, though. <laughs> oh, everyone. Oh, okay. um, no, I, I did great work for, for, for NASA. My boss was very proud of me, and uh, I remember I won, I won for him a bet one time. There was a programming task that was deemed so complicated and difficult that my boss's boss, David Howell, said to Jim Tiz, you'll not be, he won't be able to do that. You're not going to get that working. And it was networking, actually. It was very early primitive networking. It was getting this weird little real-time box to talk to a Unix, to talk to another real-time box using hacked Unix code that I, I, I figured out how to do simple networking traffic back and forth. And I was able to send a message from this box to this box, and that won my boss a lunch. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in 1987, I wrote a short story called Ice House, in which I described an, an imaginary game played with these pyramids. And now, of course, we have these pyramids. But at the time, it was just this idea that wouldn't it be cool if you had a game that had like these little like crystal pyramid things that you'd be placing out on the table? And it'd be so cool, there'd be like no turns, you could play whatever you wanted, and you wouldn't need a board, so you could play it anywhere on a table, on the floor of a subway station while you're waiting for your train. And I imagine this whole culture where gaming around these particular, with this game, this Ice House game, it's like imagine if it was like the most popular game and everyone was playing it everywhere. 
to plan it all in the game. So and people would settle disputes by playing this game or whatever. And that's like that was like the backbone of just like backstory to this weird adventure story involving a, an atomic bomb. Um, and people get trapped. It doesn't make a lot of sense sometimes. Um, but it's what people who read the story thought. That's a neat story, but the, the game with the pyramids, that sounds great. We were working on the game with the pyramids. They're like, oh, well, it doesn't exist. It's just an idea. You see, it's like a plot device. Like, like I compare it to Quidditch now. Of course, that was long before Quidditch was even a thing. In the old days, I used to compare it to Fizzbin, like if there was a real game version of Fizzbin. Everybody get that? <laughs> you all need to watch the original Star Trek. You don't need to Um... Okay, so at Fisbin's kind of relevant because in when I first started trying to then invent a game, so I, I wrote these short stories about a bunch of people playing an imaginary game, and I was kind of you know you write on you write about what you know you write about real life. So I was kind of really writing about just my buddies and I hanging out playing. Actually, we were playing a lot of Hearts. Uh, that's one of my all-time classic favorite games, and we would stay up all night playing Hearts. And so I was kind of wanting to write about the experience of, you know, you're into a game so much you're playing it all night, but I wanted to make it something fresh and new, so I invented this pyramid game. That didn't exist. And then people wanted to, so oh, I should have brought some of those, should have brought the, the short set. Um, my friend Short made me a set of pyramids out of some thick, like, polymer plastic stuff that you cast in resin. It's like, right now, invent the game now, you have some pyramids, all right. I, had, I still did not have an game. I, I did, even then, I did not think of myself as a game inventor. And it wasn't until like a year later, after writing several more stories in this universe, but still not coming up with a game, that my buddy from way back when, lifelong friend John Cooper, he was transfixed by, by this description I'd written, this five paragraph, like frustratingly detailed and yet vague, Description of a non-existing game. I was very specific about the pieces. It has exactly 60 pieces, 30 pieces, I mean, uh, three, three different sizes, 15 of each of the four colors. They come in wood and plastic and blah, blah, blah. But how do you play? Well, you sort of surround the pieces with each other. And then there's one. He took these, these five paragraphs and read them over and over again and tried to figure out how to make a game based on my descriptions. And he did. And it's the first pyramid game and we call it Ice House, and it's actually kind of a lot like my original description. Enough that we were, we were able to embrace it and say, this is the game you were writing about. Awesome. Um, years later, I actually then went back and did my own real-time pyramid game using the pyramids. It's a little more like what I envisioned, and has a lot of lessons learned from that first pyramid game. Because that first pyramid game is... Anyone? Terrible. Terrible, exactly! <laughs> The first game is always terrible. It's not actually that bad. It's a surprisingly fascinating and compelling game. It held our interest for eight years while we made game sets and tried to promote it before we finally said, mm, what if we invented some other games for these parents? And then that went crazy. Now there's 420 ish games. And some of them are great, amazingly good. Many of them are terrible. <laughs> And it's really hard to make them and sell them. So I said, can you make me a card game? Oh, no, you're getting out of me. You're getting out of me. Fight <laughs> <laughs> down you in the audience. <laughs> we made pyramids. We first were like, okay, how do we even become a game company? How do we promote these? We started doing tournaments used for this original game at a local science fiction convention called Display and, and building interest in the game. And we started making sets. We made 100 sets using the same clear plastic resin system that Short had made, the original handmade set. And those sold and were gone. I'm like, well, that one. Those were a pain in the ass to make. And they almost got us kicked out of my apartment because of the stickiest, smelly chemicals. And we're like, how do you get pieces made? It costs like $10,000 or more even back then to get an injection mold to make little plastic pieces like this. And we didn't even want them like this. See how they nest? In the old days, the original game was, was, was all pieces were always used. There was no nest. Because the original pieces were like cut out of wood and plastic and stuff. And in fact, we didn't like the idea of hollow nesting pieces. We thought, oh, they'll be cheap and nasty and like, we want hot, solid, hefty pieces. Well, you can't get, they're even harder to make. 
But we made them out of wood. I made them, at one point we, were, we, we, we figured out how to like make a die that would make the pyramids out of like punch, you know, like punch out of cardboard and fold and the tab goes in the slot. And so we had little cardboard pieces and we had sets available. That was exciting and yet they were terrible. But it was still, all these little things advanced the pieces, advanced the system. And we made a wood run, and then we started making other pieces, the other games for it, and we wanted to be able to make them, and yet Kristen, like she's, she's the party in and as I said at the beginning. Kristen, so one day, July 25th, 1996, we were driving off from work, and we were talking about the problem of the pyramids. How are we going to get the pyramids made? What do we do about the pyramids? Oh, and she said, man, these pyramids are killing me. There's so much difficult, there's so much trouble to make. Why don't you invent a card game? I can get a card game made like that. <laughs> All right, let me think about that. And the next day, I handed her a memo, and it looked like this. In fact, this is it. The memo entitled, Thoughts! Jaws run the students, 24. July 24th, 1996. I have an idea for a completely wacky and unpredictable card game. It would be easy to learn, blah, blah, blah. And it's basically exactly like I described. There'd be the rules, there'd be actions. The list of keepers I described here would be the sun, the moon, keep milk and cookies, death and taxes. And then you'd have the goals of each of those. There'd be a five keepers goal. And then there were some other stuff that didn't work. But, I was on to something really quick, and this is one thing I've learned about my games over the years, is the, the, the faster the game coalesces, the better it is. When some of my best designs seem to form themselves just fully in my head and just poof, there it is. I don't worry, just, that's, there it is, it just pops right out. Then there are the ones I spent 10 years working on, like Justice Arts, which is actually at the printer and about to come out. Oh and I think it's... The end result is very good, and a lot of why that game has taken so long to go to print is the art challenge. And uh, it's just because there's so much art. It took two artists, I almost killed both of them to get the artists. <laughs> anyway, um, I, I said, okay, let me think about this. And so, how did I invent Flux really? Well, I wanted a game that would be different every time. I spent all this time teaching ice house to people and finding it very challenging, so I wanted something that would be incredibly easy to learn, that would just draw you right in. In fact, the very first time, I, the very first playtest, when Kristen, so I wrote a memo and described this game, and she said, this is great, figure out what the cards will be, and I'll make a deck. So I figured out a list of cards, and she used an old database program on the Macintosh called Panorama. And I was able to give her like a tab delineated file of what all the cards would be and what it would say on each one and what, where they would go on the cards. And she built this template that would put all the information spewed into this file and made cards. And we cut them out and I shuffled the deck and I got my first playtest group together and I didn't tell them anything about it. I just said, try playing. Rules of draw one play. And I didn't even have to draw cards in. They didn't even start with a hand of three. But that was what I wanted. I wanted a game that would be so easy that each card would tell you what to do and you could just jump in and start playing. <coughs> but I also wanted it to be different every time. How many people know a game called Gnomic? Yeah. Alright, just a couple. Gnomic is a game about making up a game. It is an abstract metagame in which the players first design the game they're going to play as part of, design, as part of playing the game. It is terrible. <laughs> it's a great idea. It's a brilliant idea. It's, it's, it's too vague, though. It's too incomplete. Every time I have tried playing it, we kind of make up a bunch of rules about things, and then it just kind of all falls. You win if you're in. Oh, I like that one. Um, so I wanted to do something that was like, kind of, and I tried playing this Noma game and found it unsatisfying. And the reason I found it unsatisfying was 
as noted, that it, it's too broad, it's too open, you can do too much. And what's needed is more of a limited structure that says, you can change the rules and make the game what you want, but only within these limited ways. I'm going to figure out all the ways you can change the rules and set them forth for you. And I'll give you this structure that these are the things you're trying to do to win, and it, it changes too, everything changes. And there's one other influence which is called, well, two really. Um, one's called Proteus, which is published by Cato Enterprise. Did that sentence make any sense to anyone? <laughs> K-Don is a game company that's got a direct-to-consumer model, and they've been around longer than us, but they've never really become very well known. You might know her as the game puzzles lady at the Renaissance Festival. She makes all these interesting kind of puzzle games out of wood and, and acrylic. They're the ones who make these uh, wonderful volcano boards for us, if you know anything about these. And so they had a game that was called Proteus, and it, it changed as you play. It, it, in this, it was like this board game, and depending on the positions of pieces on the board, the winning conditions would vary, and your turn options would vary. I thought, that's really neat. But it's really complicated. You look at it like, I don't get it. You know, it's like, if it's a triangle, it means this, and if the square's over here, that happens. How are you supposed to remember all that? It's really, even now, I can't get my brain around it, but I like it. Um, so all of these were in my mind as I came up with, with Flux, and mostly it just popped into my head, as I said, fully formed. And I, I thought it might even be too easy. Like, you know, getting the goals together is going to be trivial and pointless. People aren't going to find that part of the interesting stuff, right? Uh, I was surprised. Um, that first play test went really well. Everybody was like, this is great. Well, except for the letters in the quarter thing. I don't know at all. Yeah, each, in my original version, each card had like a, a letter in a box in the corner. And another way you could maybe win was like to collect those together and spell words. Because <laughs> again, I was afraid that the goal part would be too easy. Yeah, that didn't last. You know, no, that didn't last for, for on the first version. Exactly. <laughs> um, still, I noticed it in my original memo. Spell the word tirade using the corner letters on the cards. So tirade, of course, master of time, face, and mention. <laughs> um, all right, so then we were off and running. I mean, it's, it's, again, the, 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 this, it, it, it came to me so quickly that everything else just built on that structure and they never changed the basic structure. Keeper's goals, new rules, and actions, and one basic rules card. Now, in original, oh, so let's see, I have a little bit of show and tell. So here is. The first edition of Flux, um, it's actually a very, very collectible one with square corners because it's one of the 25 decks we got from CMW ahead of the rest of the print so we could have some to give out at Christmas, but they didn't have time to run from the corner room. Um, the basic rules, didn't even say basic rules, and it had a black bag. And the cards were just plain drawings, but same old art. I mean, I, I, I drew, sat around one weekend and drew all the pictures for the original game, and many of them are still in use today. They've been colorized, and, and a lot of them, in, in 5.0, we took a few more and said, all right, redraw that. But, uh, I, I, I like my original guy. You know, I like my So, then, uh, we licensed the rights to ICE, and ICE went out of business, and we took back, and then we did Aquarius, and then eventually, finally, we made enough money from Aquarius that we were able to finally make the injection bowl that allowed us to make the pieces of my dreams. And then I started making more games than these, and these are really my love. I love these. If you like, if you like Flux, great, but this, this is the coolest thing I've ever And then we started making other versions of Flux, and then we started changing that. Um, the Creeper came about because of Zombie Flux. I don't really like zombies. I mean, who does? They're gross and horrible. Uh, but I was never really a fan of zombie culture, particularly. I, I'm, I, I'm a squeamish sort, and I just wasn't interested. And I avoided them until finally people were like, you've got to invent a zombie flux. Everybody keeps asking for a zombie flux. Make a zombie flux. Please make a zombie flux. 
So I stayed up one weekend and watched Night of the Living Dead, <laughs> Shaun of the Dead. And those were like, and, and I grilled various people, all right, tell me about the movie. And at one point, I, I watched Dawn of the Dead with an ex-girlfriend. The only way I could get through that was with somebody fast-forwarding through the worst parts and telling me what I, what I needed to know. Um, but I, the, the stumbling block was always, how do I put something like zombies into a game that, where it's all keepers? You don't want uh, and I remember trying, I even made some, some prototype cards that said they were creepers. I mean, they were keepers for zombies. It didn't work. It didn't deal with it. But finally, I got my, my brain around the idea of saying, let's just add more to the game. Let's add a new card to the creeper, the thing you don't want. And then it's like, well, every version has that too. In fact, we, we for 4.0, it didn't make sense for death and taxes and war to be keepers at that point. So they became reclassified as creepers. And then I took them out of the game altogether. <laughs> if you've got version 5.0 flux, you'll, you'll note that it doesn't have more death anymore, or taxes. And we might bring those cards back someday in some sort of creeper pack expansion. But for now, got to buy an old version if you want one of those. Okay, so then then we just started doing more versions. We did our first licensed version, Monty Python Flux. And I uh, started making up more versions than we could publish. And I have so many versions here that, that have yet to see the light of day in the history. <laughs> Math Flux, Chemistry Flux, Wonderland Flux, Fairy uh, Tale Flux, Drinking Flux, USA Flux, Murder Mystery Flux, My Little Pony Flux. Oh, that one. So that comes in our, there's a very special category over there. <laughs> licenses for. Everybody says, oh, make a Doctor Who flux, that'd be so great. Got it right here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have the rights to publish it. <laughs> we're, we're trying. I've had meetings. I've sat in the, the booth with the BBC guy at, at the License Expo in Las Vegas and tried to show it to him. And he's like, oh, don't show me the name of Doctor Who. <laughs> And could you please talk less quietly? I mean, more quietly, less loud. <laughs> anyway, they said no. They think it would compete with their existing Doctor Who product at this time. So maybe someday we'll get to do that. But then, oh, yeah, Amber. This is Amber, a director of sales and marketing. Hello. She's another person who says, oh, we should make this. And so I do. She said, My Little Pony's great stuff. People love it. That's a great version of My Little Pony is great. Yeah, it's my fault. That's his Oh, wait, James, are you here? I did. You! <laughs> like, really, My Little Pony? <laughs> I'm like, no, trust me, it's great. She pulled up a YouTube thing. I'm like, oh, okay. This is not the old My Little Pony. <laughs> Let me watch it. So I watched it. I watched it. And he's been to BronyCon the last two years. Yeah, I went, I, got, I went to BronyCon to do research. I watched the whole first season. Yeah, just some research. Research. Sure. Yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a brony. I, I just have to be one for my job. <laughs> <laughs> so I invented My Little Pony Flux. Prototype that. And they said, no. Not we yet. think it would compete with our existing uh, My Little Pony card game. Uh, yes, not yet. It's always not yet. Not yet. So then, Cartoon Network approached us. Oh, that's, that's how Monty Python happened also. They were like, the, the people at the Monty Python license were like, this would be a great game with Flux, we should do that. And they contacted us and we said, uh, how about if I do it for you? <laughs> I love Monty Python. Didn't have to already watch anything for that. I already, <laughs> already have the knowledge that's necessary for that one. <laughs> but when uh, Cartoon Network came calling, I'm like, ah, Cartoons lately. What do you got? I mean, I remember like old stuff. Well, we don't want anything that's not an original Cartoon Network license set. Like the stuff we've really made around Cartoon Network Studios. Well, I love Adult Swim. How about Aqua Teen Hunger Flex? Oh, well, Adult Swim, that's like a separate studio. That's like, you know, they, they're harder. How, we want you to do like a mashup of like uh, Powerpuff Girls and Dexter and like our current big stuff, Adventure Time and Regular Show. And, 
So with that stuff, I'm like, I, I remember Dexter, <laughs> Powerpuff Girls. What is this adventure time? <laughs> so I started watching cartoons a lot for my job. <laughs> And I, I, Adventure Time's great. Wow, that's some, some amazing stuff. Adventure Time fans in the house? Yeah. And, but then I was like, but I like regular show even more. <laughs> this is hilarious. Regular show, that's the show. How many regular show fans in the house? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I love regular show. So um, we were just like, well, all right, I'll do your mashup. And we made that. That's Cartoon Network for. And then we but we're, we, we want to do four with this. And so I started working on an Adventure Time Flux. And they were like, oh, well, there's Adventure Time We think it would compete with our existing Adventure Time Flux. <laughs> <laughs> we already worked with you guys. Come on, man. <laughs> fine, fine. I'll do a regular show first. So I did a regular show Flux. How many played that? All right. Oh, we're going to try. If you're a regular show fan and, and you're here, you've got to get that. It's great. I love it. Because again, I like regular show even more than regular adventure time. But um, I've been continuing to work away on my adventure time flux, hoping we would get to do that next. And indeed, we will. That one we've got a signed contract for, and adventure time flux is in development, and uh, we've played testing here for people want. And I'm really happy with the way it came. Coming out this summer. That one is the next in the pipeline. And the one that I can actually say, yes, we're definitely doing it. And then there's this. <laughs> Batman! People have been saying, oh, do a superhero thing. And I thought for a long time about doing a superhero mashup. Like, let me talk about Star Fox a little bit. Um, for years, we would say, well, if we could do a Star Trek Flux or a Star Wars Flux, which one would we rather do? Which license would be harder to get? Well, there's no question about the first one. I'm a Star Trek fan in the first four months, so for me, that's the one I would choose to do. But either license, really hard to get. <laughs> and at the end of the day, actually, I'm just as happy not having either one of them. I would rather go parody style, mash them both up with all kinds of other stuff, and Star Flux is actually my favorite version of Flux. It's got all the fun of stuff, it's got all my favorite material, and I'm really glad I waited as long as I did before trying to tackle that material because of that debate. Because the result is that Starflux has got like all the best innovations that the game has come up with over the years. Because the game itself, it's like, it, it's, it, things, creations take on a life on their own. You know, I mean, Flux is bigger than me at this point. And, it continues, I, I'm amazed at how I'm continually able to find new ways, even now, new ways to change up the game, new, new rules, new cards, new ideas for how to, to tweak the engine, get a little more out of it, go to a new place with it. Each new version I try to have, there be some, some special differences, a few new rules, a few new actions, to make the, all the stuff fit the theme a little bit, and add a little new, a little newness. And sometimes it's hard, the last few, some of them are just, uh, there's nothing really new about it, it's just different things. But I still keep coming up with like, some good stuff in Adventure Time and Batman. I'm going to use both of them. I'm going to you know, couple of the rules and do both of them. But they also have each their own crazy uses. Now, Batman is not official, so don't, don't say anything about this. Shh. <laughs> <laughs> Mom's the word. Really close. We're this close to signing the contract, and oh man, that preliminary art they sent us. Ooh, it looks so good. <laughs> but we have actually signed that contract yet. And these, don't talk about them, but if you want to see them, I can show them to you. No pictures. <laughs> so, that's how we've been in flux. And some more about the history since then. I've talked a long time. Any questions? You. What is drunk in flux? <laughs> it does not exist. <laughs> it is not a thing. <laughs> Maybe we'll come back to what? <laughs> so, how long were you still working at NASA before you quit and started doing this full time? I worked at NASA for eight years. Then I went to work for a a multimedia company called Magnet Interactive Studios, where I programmed video games from the 3DO. 
Anyone know that? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone play Icebreaker? All right, a couple of people. That's that's the game actually. That's an important part of the story I skipped actually. Um, when I was still just thinking of myself as a programmer, I but I was tired of working on NASA because the thing is, it sounds really cool to work for NASA. It sounds even cooler to work on something that flies in space. It's tedious grinding work. It's not actually that much fun. <laughs> Sit in a lot of meetings and talk about testing, testing, testing. To put any line of code on a spacecraft as important as Hubble, it must be tested 10,000 times in every which way. And it's using hardware from like 10 years ago because that's what was approved to fly at the time. It was brutal, actually. Oh, programming the DF-224. What's that? The digital fixed point twos complement 24-bit computer. <laughs> Handle attitude and guidance control. Anyway, uh, I was really happy to finally quit NASA, even though NASA was really, really good for me. And NASA put every meal on the table for me for my entire life until Net Flux took that job away. Pretty much. It was the, the magnet time. So I was talking about that. So for a while I went to work for Magnet. And they were a, a multimedia company in the days just before the internet really took off. And they were making like, CD-ROMs that were like, you could just go to the website for that now. But at the time, like, the, there was no website, so you could get like encyclopedias on CD-ROMs. And that's what they were doing. And they were like, we're going to make games for this new thing, the 3 Oh, it's going to be great. And then a year later, the PlayStation came out and crushed the 3 Oh. But I invented one of the only games to actually come out for the 3 Oh. Well, there were only like a couple hundred, I guess. So for it to come out is something. But, it was also the only game product that actually came out of this multi-million dollar video game effort. Most of which was sucked up by something called Blue Star. But I invented a game accidentally. Again, accidentally. I'm just like the accidental in the game. I, I was programmed to, to write code for this, this new platform. And so I, I dug in and started figuring out how to make things happen on the video game screen. And, I made a little widget that was able to move around, and I, I made a tiled landscape for it that slid as he moved, and made the thing be able to shoot things, and you could tell if it shot something, it would bounce off, or what? But now you can shoot the thing, and it'll, it'll blow up. And for want of anything better to make the characters in this weird little video game I was creating, I used my pyramids! <laughs> They're easy to draw, and I love them, and also I hate them. I, there was, I'm taking my frustration out on these by making a game where you destroyed them. <laughs> and it was just a programming exercise that became an actually compelling little game. You're driving a little pyramid around, shooting at other pyramids, they're blowing up. Oh, and they made these, these mobile pyramids, yellow pyramids that would move and get towards you. And if they touch you, you die. And you have to clear this whole grid of pyramids with only one guy. No, no extra lives. When do you get extra lives? You're dead. you're dead. <laughs> so, I had all these people, first, first my fellow programmers would keep coming into my queue, hey, and then people started noticing that, hey, everybody's playing this weird little game, it's not a real game, and the boss got wind of it and said, let's make it a game, <laughs> and so programmers, I mean, uh, artist types and, and graphic designers were hired to Add it to my team. Suddenly I had a team. I had a project manager guy. Suddenly he was like telling me what to do about making my game. <laughs> and that was really, uh, you know, I, I can't invent games. Hmm. I should maybe try it. Maybe if I actually really focus on it, I can. So I invented a game. The second game for the pyramids was Martian Chess, which was based on the single model of chess. And then I also did a game with a weird little triangular board called Trice which had dynamic win conditions like that Proteus game I was talking about. And which is also one of the things that was in my mind leading up to Flux again with changing the win conditions. You asked about Drinking Flux. Drinking Flux is a prototype that we made and decided not to publish because it's just too good. <laughs> I made a study of all of the drinking games. I'm not actually a drinker. Rarely do. Drank a lot more in 
those couple of months, and I <laughs> <laughs> all of my rest of my life. Like, we'd have drinking flux plaintiff parties. We were like, the is getting drunk! <laughs> But I, I studied all the other gaming, all the drinking games to figure out, well, how do they work? And uh, how are they different from smoking games? Which I also have. But drinking flux makes you drink so much that it worries us. That you will drink yourself to death if you publish this game. <laughs> because that's a thing, you know. You can die from drinking alcohol in one night. And we wouldn't want that on our hands. So what we're going to do is make a Kickstarter. What? Where you <laughs> buy, buy Drinking Flux for $100. And 80 of those dollars goes to the Drinking Flux Legal Defense Fund. <laughs> no, we're not. And that was all a joke. We're not doing that. Um, but in any event, next question. You. Um, yes, I've played Flux before with friends where we've actually like combined decks before. What? I uh, people do that a lot. And I always say, you know, you're you're a consumer, you can play with the game however you want. And more power to you. I love it when people change the game up and make it their own, adding new rules and add new ways to play is great. And that's what I mean when I say it's taken on a life of its own. People, people make their own flux version based on my ideas and take it in directions I never thought of. And a common one is to mix them. I generally avoid that because games become too long. You, when, you, when you plump up the deck with multiple different editions, it becomes so hard to get the right combination of goal, and there's so many different keepers and so many goals and so few of them really work with what you have, and you have all these things that don't go together really, and there are some combinations that work pretty well, but others are just like, what are those doing in here? It doesn't even compute. So I usually, and, and, and I try to make each version complete and unique and special unto itself with everything you write down. So I don't particularly condone deck combining, <laughs> but I certainly don't object to it, and uh, if you want to play it that way, go right ahead. We are careful to keep the facts identical on all decks so that you may. But some of that to me is more about deck building, like if you want to be able to take that one really cool rule out of that and put it in here, rather than just wholesale shuffle together. But again, how do you want? You! Uh, piggybacking off of that, me and my girlfriend play Flux a lot, and there are two cards that we remove from the game. Mm -hmm. Two gold cards, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on why we, why we do that. Um, one is ten cards in hand. And the other is five keepers. They go together. Why do you dislike the two numerical goals? They shorten the game to a weird, like, oh, that card came up, so that's it. You know, when we're playing the game, we tend to shun away from, you know, those limiter rules, and we play with those cards, but we, we remove, get them out of the way. As soon as that goal is one of the first goals. <laughs> <laughs> You're betraying history. <laughs> no, that, seriously, that's fine. I don't mind, again, if a card, if there's a card you don't like, take it out. Go ahead. It's a modifiable game. And when there's a card I don't like, it goes out completely. <laughs> <laughs> what, was, what was the one that you first won the, the double the, No, the... Keeper shortage? The one that makes you flip them over government cover-up? Oh, 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 government cover-up secret data. Uh, and, uh, I hate those cards. And, uh, you probably don't know them because they're only in the first edition. Yeah. Yeah. There are cards that allow you to hide your keeper, but still have it. And you can hide one, or you can hide all. And if I could, you had to. So, and Kristen hated these cards because the usual model would be at a show or wherever, and I'm teaching and demoing the game to a group of people, and she's over here shilling and drumming up interest for the next game, trying to get people to stop and play. And, and so she'll be pointing to us as we're as playing, saying, see, here's how we're blah, blah, blah. And it's very frustrating to try to explain what's going on in a game where the government cover-up is hiding all the keepers. 
Um, that rule pretty much went away. It came back in camouflage for eco flux. Right. Then only with one card. Government cover up has never come back. What? <laughs> okay, sure. For anyone who doesn't know that, there is usually a code that lets you figure out what version each flux card comes from. Um, there's a web page on our site that, that explains them all in the case by case. Which is, I know, I think I, how did you find it? I, I handed off that information. I don't know if we got updated, but why don't yeah, yeah, I gave the updates. <laughs> Most of the time, it's a different font. If you look at the top of the card where it says keeper or action or whatever, that font will change with the version. So in Star Flux, it's like a Star Trek looking font. On Pirate Flux, it's all like, you know, old tiny. Zombie, Zombie Flux is trippy. Um, sometimes there's others, little codes on the stripes or whatever, but those are early versions where we kind of stopped doing that just with the code, with the font code. So know your fonts, and then you can separate your decks back out after you have fun combining them, which of course I encourage. I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> you! Uh, how did you know about making the flex working, and how is it different from designing parking? Well, uh, we had a guy named Josh Trubino working for us at the time, and he said, you know what, I had a dream last night. And I only remember from it, it's just, I was looking at a shelf of games, and there it was, Flux the board game. And I said, shut your mouth! Flux <laughs> 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 the board game. Well, it's an interesting idea. What would I do? What would that be? Oh, uh, it's been like a, a year and a half. What does that tell you? <laughs> That's terrible. Yes! <laughs> no, it's not terrible. It does have one terrible problem. The dang pegs. Oh. The, 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 That's I, a it has, problem. It has a, a pegboard. So with Flex the Board Game, all the rules are, all the, it, instead of piling the rules up in the center where table space is a premium, because there's this board now, and the board is ever changing with these tiles that move around, and, and spots that you have to occupy that are kind of like keepers and pieces that move around the board. And so the rules, um, instead of piling up the rules in the middle, we made this pegboard that has all the possible ways the rules can change. And peg, so if it's draw two, you move the draw peg to you know, draw two point. And when I was play testing, and I was making it out of cardboard things, and I would just pick, poke my own holes with a scratch on hole, and the pegs were great. But when we actually got it manufactured, and the holes were drilled into cardboard, the, the, you, you'd set the thing on the table, and the, the pegs pop up, and they fall out. So frustrating. So manufacturing disaster. Yeah. Um, and it's just I don't know. It's like the board game ends up being more complicated than I really thought I wanted it to be. But it's cool. I mean, it's it's it definitely is a little more strategic, in fact, than regular flux because you have to meet, uh, meet several goals instead of just one in order to win. And the number of goals you have to collect in order to win can change because everything can change. Your piece color can change. A lot of things in the beach about Yeah, yeah. And the way the boards move around, it's, it's kind of an ever-changing game board. It's very cool. Um, it's still a little more complicated than I would like to do, which is why Microgame 816 is sort of the, the simple, easy version of the board game. But that doesn't exist. <laughs> That's just the thing. It's got such a cray. It's just like, okay, it doesn't even have a real name, Microgame 816. Well. <laughs> oh, it's good. <laughs> Questions? I saw your hand. So, actually, the first time I ever saw you guys was at an Origins Shilling Aquarius. Mm. Uh, wow, with our tie dye tent and our little coffee table lounge? Yes, with the uh, awning. Yeah. Awning. So, 1998. Was that the first Origins you That's the year you were describing. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember because. I was working at a different booth at that con, and I had long hair back then. So every time I went past you guys, uh, one of your booth assistants would always tackle me because I would always go first. Right, right. Aquarius, for those of you who don't know, and Aquarius, the player with the longest hair, goes first. <laughs> so I'm sort of wondering where Aquarius falls in this history, because I remember seeing Aquarius before I ever saw clubs. 
Well, they came out pretty quick after. In 1996, I ended in flux. We sent it to the printer and just before Christmas, but it didn't really come out until the spring of 97. And we kind of officially launched it, if you will, at Origins 97, where we got our first actual trade show booth and, and set up and, and it was me at a table playing a game and Kristen up front getting people to play like I just described. And by the end of the time we had that we've been talking about your new game for us. <coughs> and we got three different companies to offer to publish it for us in the next edition. One of them was Steve Jackson Games, and one of them was Iron Crown Enterprises, who, and the third one was USA, US Playing Cards, who was getting in to try to do other, other more published games than just cards, but kind of gave up on that for a while. And we turned down Steve because he was further away, and Royalty rate, he, did, he offered what was good, and we liked the idea of Iron Crown. And they published their version of it in 1998. And we said, all right, we're going to be like a design studio. I'll invent a game, we'll publish a first run, show that it's great, and then license the rights to another company, and we'll just keep doing that, and it'll be awesome. So we licensed the rights to Iron Crown, and I started working on my next game, and that was Aquarius. And we published Aquarius in 1998, and weren't even selling Flux ourselves at those trade shows. Ice, Ice was promoting it in their booth along with their whole life, and we were watching and saying, "I feel like Flux is down there, but here's Aquarius." And we're like, "Dang, Aquarius is nowhere near as good a game as Flux." How <laughs> <laughs> many? It's, it's, it's all right. How many people have played Aquarius? Quite a few. Well, it's a great game, actually. I love it. Sales wise, it is crushed by Flux. And uh, after about two years, Iron Crown went bankrupt. Not even the awesome power of Flux can save it. <laughs> they had big debt issues. That, they lost the middle of life. Yeah, and then, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a problem. When, when the Peter Jackson movie started happening, they had been Iron Crown Enterprise. It's like it's it's a Tolkien game. That was their bread and butter. They had all these different Tolkien games, the Tolkien collectible card game. And then when uh, when New Line got the movie rights, the Tolkien estate pulled the game rights, and that really devastated us. And they filed for bankruptcy, and that meant that the rights returned to us. And we said, well. That's just as good, because we're getting kind of tired of being in the backseat, and would rather just go ahead and be a game company. And that is when we really made what we call the leap off the cliff. That's when I quit my day job, and about a year later, Chris quit her day job, and we joined it. We, we, we took all of our money and put it in the company, maxed out our credit and put it in the company, all of the belief that we would make money before we <laughs> and we're still here! <laughs> still on the turnip But we're doing all right. We now have eight full-time employees. And we had our best year ever last year. This year's going to be the best. You! I'm just wondering, how similar is getting an additional flux out there? Say, I want to do zombie flux, but I want to do zombie flux. How similar is that process to writing a novel? When someone says, hey, I like this model, but this is hot now. We can write it in the genre. Um, I think writing a novel is harder. I may just think that because I haven't written very many novels. And at this point, I can design a new flux in my sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but it does take a fair bit to do a new flux, depending on the subject matter. I got a absorb it, get my mind around it, break it down, figure out what the big tropes are, figure out what are, gonna, what are, what are the rules going to be, what are the keepers going to be, what are the goals that go together, how do I make all the keepers adequately useful, how do I justify leaving that out, why is this in, how do I make rules that fit the theme, come up with some actions. But a lot of that stuff I can crank out, you know, in days or weeks, depending on how familiar I am or the subject matter. Um, 
But I know people write a novel in a month. Right? But I feel like, like novels, a lot of times, they, they may spend years working on their, their books. But I suddenly spend years working on games. So they're comparable, but the novel's probably harder. Make those comparisons up to a certain point. Yeah. Next question. You. So, when you're working on a new version of Flux, do you build a mathematical model and run simulations to see what we I just play it. I do have a process that I call the goal push up, where I, I lay out all of the keepers on the floor, and then I go through the goals one by one, and whatever it uses, I push them up. And after a while, I have an arrangement on my, my floor where these keepers are using five goals, these keepers are using four goals, these keepers are using three goals, these keepers are using two goals. These that aren't even used in two goals, they got to be fixed. Every keeper has to have at least two uses. Now, if it has a function, like Text that says you can do this if if you have this code. That counts as a, as as a use. So, for example, I believe the expendable crewman in Starflux is only used on one goal, but he's also used on his own very usefully. So he doesn't need any more goals. Well, he's expendable. Exactly. Well, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> but so I, I'll lay them out, and, and then I'll say, all right. Well, clearly these goal these care keepers aren't needed enough. Um, what can I do that like? And, and, and that would be a, a great creative time to lay it out and say, well, these, what are these things down here that aren't used very much? What, what do they have in common? How can I create a goal that, that makes these two underused things both get used more and ties them together in an interesting way? And sometimes I'll think of some plot thing that makes it perfect, or sometimes I'll just go with a pun. Yes? So would you rather have everything be on like level three or level four, or would you rather have some... Five, no, I like there to be some range. Um, Flux is not a fair game. It is not a balanced game. Balance is overrated. Um, sometimes you get good luck, sometimes you don't. And sometimes you get good luck from one minute to the next. And then, then your luck changes. And I like there to be some texture to the keepers to know that, oh yeah, keep that one. Strategically, that's better to keep because it appears on more goals than the other ones. If they were all <coughs> useful and equally, then I think there would be a little bit of, of value loss. <laughs> chocolate, exactly. In original flux, chocolate is the most useful keeper. It appears on more goals than any other. Goal. And so, whenever then I'm doing a new version, the question becomes: Well, what is the chocolate of this set? <laughs> For example, Oz Flux, Dorothy is the chocolate of the set. Um, sometimes it's not real obvious, but why is that? Oh, just the most useful one. Um, so, next question. No more questions? Yeah. Are you ever going to publish Murder Mystery Flux? Because that sounds really awesome. <laughs> well, any question of this form? <laughs> I defer to the others in my company. <laughs> I just invent the games. I don't decide when anything is going to happen. Uh, murder Mystery Flux is, yeah, Chris, ask me. Please direct that question. <laughs> or perhaps Amber. I don't see her now. She's hiding. Did Amber leave? Yeah, it's, I, I, I have this giant pile of unpublished ones. And they're all really cool. And I'd like to publish well, most of them. And I'd like to think sooner or later most of them will find the light of day. Uh, Murder Mystery Flux is kind of clue, kind of version of Flux, and it's fun, it's neat. But is it at all on our radar to publish? Not soon. Who knows? Maybe someday. But there's only a you know, there's a limited number of new titles we can bring out a year. We're still a small company. Our funding is is on the edge. And we have to choose each new title to be the strongest and best that we can. And, and 
And we worry about market saturation. I mean, how many versions of Flux are you going to make? <laughs> well, a lot, because they're all great. Each one is different and fun. But how many can we really bring out each year? A couple. Like uh, this year, if we do Batman and Adventure Time, that's about all we can do. We, oh, well, we are going to do more of them. <laughs> Flux dice. Ooh, that's right. Flux dice are coming in. Let's see. Dice. What are Flux dice? Dice, there's a draw one and a play one. And so instead, of, they, they, they supersede the basic rules. On your turn, you roll the dice, and now it says, draw five, play one. So that's what we get. And then on your turn, you will draw three, play four. And so these little dice will be something you can put in any different version of place. And uh, these are, there's, because there's no license at all, I don't know how to get any of these right. Coming out in August. This is just in time to get out, hopefully. The only problem is dice are hard to make. Dice, we gotta go to China for. We get all our card games printed in about a machine, but no one in America makes dice here. So I'll well, try to not add it in any kind of affordable way. Yeah. Next question. Uh, how did the licensing breakdown for a Back to the Future card game? What do you mean, the breakdown? Well, I mean, uh, how, I mean, how did it uh, come to be? Um, we were saying for years, well, if we did a version of Chrononauts that was based on a license, what would be good? And the immediate answer was Back to the Future. Big fan of it, and it's got a nice timeline sized out for, you know, a, a, a nice series of events in the three movies that would let us very well in the timeline. And so Kristen said, well, can you do it? And I said, let me, let me find, let me see if I can before you go after the rights. And she said, well, let me make sure that I can get the rights before you spend any real time on it. So she made a couple calls and said, it looks like we could probably do it. Can you make a game? Said, All right. So I watched the movie as much and tinkered up a timeline enough to say, yes, I can make a game. Now. And then, so she went out to the rights, and we were able to get them. But they were expensive. They wanted big advances, and they were annoying to work with every single, single tiny little thing we wanted to do with change of sand. You had to get approved. You have to get permission for everything, including any kind of marketing or anything. And it like was a tweet. Like five years ago, when Twitter was new enough, that, and all their rules were written long ago by people who don't know the, the internet. So it was really true that if I'm going to put a tweet out, that I had to go get it approved first, which means you can't tweet. I mean, tweet, it's like, you know, you like put a big database of things together. By the time you, you've got permission to tweet about the thing, the event is long gone that you want to tweet about. Anyway, we did publish Back to the Future, and we ran it for the three years of its license, but we weren't selling enough of it to make it worth continuing to meet their financial uh, sale requirements and all that. We thought about trying to renew it, you know, this year because it's the future. <laughs> but decided, you know, it's, just, you know, it's not selling. Well. <coughs> yeah, but you can still buy it at MSRP, basically, because the what was left over when the license ended, we all sold. We sold all of it to our Back distributors to and to BackToTheFuture.com. And so he bought it up to keep it in, in you know. Yeah, we, we were still, I mean, they, yeah. we, we needed to be, you know, the time was up and we still had a lot of product that we had sold, so we sold it all off. So, since we didn't have the rights to keep selling it, to someone who could keep selling it. Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes, thanks. But backtothefuture.com if you want a copy of it, it's a great game. It is? Um, yeah, it's, awesome. it's wonderful. You have a question? Um, I think so, it's really, like, the game, like, floods, it, it really could lend itself to almost any, like, game or adaptation. Yeah. Um, what generally, yeah, what kind of directs you first toward one theme or another to be able to do what you to do? Usually it's personal preference. I mean, I, 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 if I like it, if I don't like it, it's not gonna, I don't, I'm not gonna make a flux out of something I don't like. So I, I focus in on subject matter I like, and sometimes I have to be proud of it and liking it, like zombie flux. Uh, now, 
zombie stories are interesting. I just don't like all the decapitations and such. <laughs> the stories are, you know, post-apocalyptic kind of Twilight Zone world. All right, I can get it. Um, I don't know. I, people write to us all the time. Oh, you should do this block. So you should do that block. So after I hear enough times, people say, do this one, do this one, do this one. All right, what is it? <laughs> but to some degree, it's also like what's going to sell. Yeah. You know, what's going to be popular? You know, what do the largest number of people want? So that you know, it makes sense to put yeah. all the work in. That's why I worked out about the Batman license, because it's like <coughs> five on popular licenses of all time. Uh, you had a question, but you get asked the questions all the time. And I see several others back there. What is it? Real quick. What's your question, real quick? Oh, sorry. Um, it was having to do with Back to the Future that. So it is not chrononauts. So you know how to play chrononauts. No, it's based on chrononauts, but it's significantly different. So I was wondering, how did that, did you like completely rethink the whole thing, or was it? No, it's more like, wait, how can I streamline a basic game to be a little bit faster? I'm not trying to that's what I was. All right, so there were some, some hands in the back, and we moved back to the back. Start with you, then. Thanks for coming. Thank you all.